Hello, I'm going to talk about this now. Uh, I'm not very well prepared, but I'm sorry. Uh, you can reach me at these things, so talk to me. Um, right, so what is Condra? Condra is a single player game for PC, uh, which was released in January this year, so it's fairly new still. Uh, it was released to all these platforms, Steam, Itch.io, and our website. So those are like, if you're not a games person, those are like the big uh, game publishing sites online. It is in the genre of being an action RPG and a platformer. And most importantly for this, it's written fully in Common Lisp. So I'm just going to show you that because we can do that. So, all right, here's the game. I'm playing it. We got some enemies that can do that stuff. So, jump around and all that. I got some massive delay on the inputs, which is fun. Uh, so I'm playing this through the capture card. So let me see if I can try and get that ledge up there. Uh, almost. Okay, we got it. Amazing. All right, enough about my extreme gamer skills. Uh, let's talk about what we can actually, what we have to do to make a game like this happen. So we need to draw things to the screen fairly quickly. Uh, most monitors these days still run at 60 frames, but uh, 140 frames per second are becoming much more common. So we have quite a tight time constraint on that. We need to put sound to the speakers even more quickly. So usually we have like 48 kilohertz, uh, which means if you have like a buffer of uh, 100 frames, to run at like 480 frames per second. Uh, so the latency is there even more constrained. Uh, we need to get input from the user fairly quickly because as we saw before, when there's like ha even half a second of delay between me pressing a button and it happening, it's very disorienting and hard to play. Uh, we need to simulate the game somewhat quickly. We can actually cheat a bit there and like upload things over multiple frames sometimes. So that's a bit more lenient than the rest of the stuff. Uh, we need to show fairly complicated user interfaces, so both for actually configuring the game so that people with different abilities and computers and so forth can play it, and also for different kinds of in-game stuff, like showing health, showing a shop, and so forth. And we need to release the game at some point, hopefully, uh, but we got a lot more time for that than anything else. Right, so for drawing, uh, we are using GLFW, which is like a C library. Uh, we're using that to provide the open writing system window and the OpenGL context stuff. Doing those things is like super complicated on all platforms and way more annoying than it has any right to be. Uh, there is a Lisp library, but it's not maintained. So we're using GLFW and that has been like surprisingly little friction for us. And so we have little incentive to replace it with a pure Lisp solution. Uh, one thing for drawing that's super important is to not load anything while the game is actually running. So we can't try to load in new graphics or assets because that might suddenly explode our frame budget and, leave, and lead to like stuttering. Uh, we need to also minimize the amount of data we shuffle between the CPU and the GPU because maxing out the bus and uh, stalling the pipeline also leads to more delay that we can often afford. So it's a lot about preloading data, allocating things ahead of time, and making sure that we only have things running at runtime that are already sort of pre-computed. Uh, so we have a lot of special systems in trial to handle this. So we can pre-compile all the shaders, we can pre-allocate buffers and do all of that stuff in one dedicated load section where the user is just like waiting for a couple of seconds without anything on screen. And then ideally during runtime, we don't have to know or load anything else. This isn't always possible, but for the most part. We also have custom shader systems to make the actual like drawing logic on the GPU easier to implement. Uh, we have two previous papers on this, so if you're interested in our particular approach to this kind of stuff, uh, you can see previous ELS publications for that. For the sound, um, so the usual solution in games for sound is to use WISE or FMOD. Those are two big sound packages, but are both huge C++ blobs uh, and Particularly, both of them, when we started out, were not available for free. So that was another disincentivizing factor. Uh, so we implemented Libmix, which is like a small C core to just do audio mixing and effects processing. And then we have CLMix, which is a Lisp library, a library on top of that, which then also implements decoding from sound files and encoding to the operating system. So we implemented a bunch of different outputs for all platforms directly in Lisp. So you can output 
sound there directly. And at some point you could also replace Libmix if you can make it fast enough. And then you have Harmony on top of all of that, which provides a sound server. So it provides all the threading support and like easy methods of playing back sounds, controlling the playback and so forth. So GC here is actually the biggest problem for the rest of the stuff. GC is like, doesn't really matter. It doesn't seem to impact us even if we have GC pauses, but for sound, it can be a, a big deal because of the increased latency constraints, we can't have big buffers, uh, but we can't have any additional latency either because then the sound is going to drop out. You get crackles, you get weird blips and burps, and those are really grating. Um, so ideally you will be able to run the, uh, audio thread without any GC at all. So you could pin all the objects and just tell the implementation that it's not going to touch this thread. So it's not going to park it, but unfortunately that's not currently possible to do, but if we can do that, that would be fantastic. So far we've managed to get by, but that's mostly because the amount of processing we do and the amount of sounds we schedule onto the thread or the uh, schedule is fairly minimal. So I assume that once we start scaling that up, we would run into more problems with the GC. As for input, uh, GLFW takes care of the keyboard and mouse input for us. Uh, we implemented a separate library called GamePad, which does GamePad inputs. Uh, this is more of a problem than you would assume. GamePads are horrible devices that are underspecified. So there's thousands of different variants out there all doing their own things with like different input maps. Uh, so we need our own device mapping specifically configured for each device. If you have a device that doesn't work out of the box with Condra, please submit a patch. Thank you very much. Um, we also need OS integration for other things like dialog boxes when there's a crash or some other kind of thing like there's no OpenGL at all. We still need to let the user know about this. And so we need to draw native dialog boxes. We need to query for system fonts and we need to also be able to query the username and like what their preferred language is so we can start the game up in that language if available. And we need to have some kind of fairly advanced input system that allows the user to remap the keys and buttons uh, and not just remap them from different things, but also like uh, climbing here is like holding down a button by default, but that turns out to be difficult for certain disadvantaged users. So we need to be able to change that to be a toggle instead as well. So there's a lot of complexity in the mapping. And this is only for like a game like this, where you have only on and off states, that's kind of trivial. But then once you get into different games where you have analog states, the mapping logic can get even more complex. As for the simulation, the biggest problem there is collision detection. Uh, that's pretty much what any game developer is going to tell you. Uh, it's always horrible because you can never do what's mathematically correct. You always have to cheat. You always have to bend the rules to make it easier and nicer to play. And that invites bugs and that's hard to test and hard to keep straight as you evolve. Uh, you also need like several spatial query acceleration structures because there's huge worlds and you need to filter out all the objects that aren't going to be involved in a collision anyway. Uh, and we didn't have any of those libraries available when we started out. Now there's libraries, but there's still lots of work to do. One thing that's really nice though, is that class is just amazing for modeling interactions. So like one of the big functions we have in the game is called uh, collide, which takes two parameters, uh, the thing initiating the collision and the other thing responding to it. And then we can model all sorts of different interactions with that multiple dispatch. So for instance, we can say, when the player collides with an elevator, it should see that as a solid entity. But when an NPC, a non-playable character, interacts with it, it should not see it as a solid, so it's just going to fall through. And so we avoid weird situations where, for instance, the character might get squashed by the elevator if they're not getting up or things like that. So modeling these kinds of various different interactions that can happen between the different types of uh, entities we have in the game is really, really nice with multiple dispatch. We also have a lot of mixings going on. So we encapsulate different behaviors. Like we have a, uh, a mix in for a collidable thing that is solid. We have a mix in for something that can be interacted with. We have a mix in for something that can be animated and so forth. And things like, can this uh, uh, thing interact with the combat system? And all of those things compose quite nicely through mix ins and the uh, class dispatch. As for user interfaces, we had a bit of a problem. So. We couldn't use McClim. Uh, it doesn't have an OpenGL backend. Still doesn't. It's in the works, I think, but it's not done. Uh, it doesn't have great styling support. So one of the things that's important for games is that you can style all the user interface libraries. So this does not look like any operating system I've seen, right? But 
uh, in order to make the user interface look native to the game, you need to be able to style it quite extensively, and that includes animations and all sorts of things. We can't use Qt. Uh, there is no modern binding still. Comma uh, Qt5 is sort of there, but it's not done yet. Like, and Qt6 is already out, so and it's a huge C++ blob as well, so that's inviting memory demons. Uh, GTK, same thing, uh, even worse binding support. LTK, not capable enough by far. And Clog, which is the new front runner of the UI stuff, is running in a browser, and I'm not going to ship a browser in a game, so that's out. Which means we have to make our own thing, uh, so this is Alloy. I think I talked uh, the Lightning talk about this before, but it's a new stack of protocols, so it takes a similar approach to Klim in that it has an abstract set of like interface protocols that work at different levels of abstraction down to what is actually going to be interacting with the operating system and drawing things. Uh, we implemented a lot of different layouting algorithms for this, so there's even a constraint layout. Constraint layout definitions are really handy, especially for games where you have to deal with many different resolutions and like configurations of how things are laid out, and the layout can now respond to that and like shuffle components around depending on that. And it's very easy to style with presentation system, which is not quite the same thing as the McLean thing. So the naming is a bit unfortunate, but that allows us to like very easily style things in a declarative way. So more similar to like CSS <coughs> kinds of things. And uh, that allows us to very quickly change the looks of components to support the need we have in that particular instance. We also have very vitally import for non-pointer input devices. So a lot of UI toolkits, Qt, GDK, and so forth are laid out primarily for pointer devices where you have a mouse or some kind of touch device where you can point on a thing. But if you have a game controller, you can't do that. Emulating like a cursor with that is horrible. You don't want to do that. And so you need some kind of easy way to declare in which order you can traverse those if you just have like a digital input system where you just point next one one down, one up, and so forth. And those doing that in any other kind of toolkit is usually a pain in the ass. And important for us, it's very easy to integrate with anything that runs OpenGL if you're using the GL backend. So if you have your own engine, it should also be fairly easy to put in there. Next is the deployment. So once we actually got a game, we need to get it over there to actual users that are going to play the game. So what we've done is we automate the building for Linux and Windows. Uh, on Linux, we just built the Linux native version using an SPCL version that was compiled on an older kernel so that it's supported on older Linux distributions. We can just run that and dump the core, and that's perfectly fine. Works great. Uh, for building Windows, we just run Wine, uh, and that works fantastic as well. So from Windows, we can do now the same thing in reverse. We just run SPCL under WSL2, and we can build for Linux, dump our binaries out there. We got both platforms covered. Mac OS, unfortunately not. Uh, there's a project called Darling, which is supposed to do the th same thing as Wine, but uh, SPL, SPCL just hangs on there, and I tried to contact the devs. They have not gotten back to me in three years, so uh, we'll see, maybe someday. Um, we need to also manage different build configurations, so we need to handle a uh, a development mode where you have like several checks activated and like safety guards and so forth and then we want to deactivate all of those for a release build because we know the game is probably going to work right so we want to get the performance boost from deactivating those and then we want to automate uploading to all of these different platforms so we did that now if you have a system configured for uh, trial you can hit one command which is usually just like ASDF make my game and it'll build it for both platforms It'll check that it actually launches and can start up, and it'll upload it to all the platforms you designated to, and that's all done in one, one thing. And that's hugely valuable for getting things out to testers and like quickly iterating and fixing bugs that they find. On fixing bugs, we actually need to know what those are. And one of the problems of making games for PC is that there is just a gazillion different PC configurations out there, and you have no idea what the hardware is or what software they're running. Are they running Norton Antivirus? I don't know. Um, so when the game crashes, inevitably, we need to actually gather the crash report. We need to get information from that system, like what architecture are they running? What kinds of system do they have? Uh, what was the lock that led to the crash? So we built this feedback system, which can scrape that system information out. It'll also gather the log file that was generated by the game. 
it'll grab a screenshot when it can. It'll take the safe state uh, in the game. So the game has like a, a safe state system. It'll grab the current safe state so that if it's an actual game problem, we can replicate that and just immediately jump to the point where the problem occurred. And it'll send all of that stuff to our server where it's generating uh, uh, like a bug ticket and that sends an email to me. So usually when the game crashes for you, within less than a minute, I get an email in my inbox and I'm like, oh shit, what did I break this time? So if you want to bother me, just cr crash the game a bunch of times. <laughs> um, yeah. And what's next? So we released Chondria in January. It's out. We also released the first major update, which was the level editor. So you can hit a button at any time in the game. So if I go over here real quick, uh, can I get cursor, please? Ah, presentation mode. Well, you can hit a button and you enter the editor mode immediately. So that's now out in the release game. You can make your own worlds. You can publish them to a mock collection. You can download worlds that other people made and play those. Uh, we want to make dedicated modding uh, the next big thing. So we promised that during our Kickstarter campaign and that's still coming. So uh, we'll have a stable API for the game. And if you want to add new features to it, new platforming elements, change textures and whatever, that will be in there. And we want to see if we can get a switch port going, but that depends mostly on money, which I do not have much of. Uh, so if we get a grant, which we're, we're going to know in a couple of weeks, or if there's like a very wealthy person in the audience that's going to just foot the bill for that, please talk to me. Thank you. Um, so we're going to try and do that because that will be like really exciting having this run on a proprietary system like the Nintendo Switch. Uh, we're also working on better trial 3D support in the engine, so we're doing a lot of work with that. We implemented a physics system, uh, we implemented skeletal animation, and we're doing lots of stuff around better collision detection and so forth. But there's just a huge ton of work left to do. But it's all open source, so that means now you have to do all that work, and I don't. I can just sit back and watch my GitHub coins rake in, right? Well, that's about it. Uh, if you're interested in games at all, or just interested in following the development of this stuff, uh, come hang out with us in the Hashirakuma channel on Libra Chat, uh, and support us on Kandria.com. Why shall we start with one? <laughs> how long it took uh, to build everything and how many people worked uh, on this? Uh, you mean how, to, how long it took to make the game? Yes. Okay. How many people worked uh, on that? Yes. So I was the sole... Maybe you can repeat the question for the... Oh, uh, right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, how long did it take to like make the game and, and like how many people played? So, and how big was the team? Uh, I'm the, I was the only programmer on the team, so I did all, all that work. I did the initial concepting and all of that stuff, and a lot of the art as well. But other than me on the team were uh, Tim, who did all the quest writing and all the dialogue. And then we had Fred, who did the combat animations and background art. And then we had Mikkel, who did our soundtrack, which is excellent. You can't hear it, but it's excellent, I promise. And then we had Kai, who did sound effects. So pretty much all the art stuff was uh, also Part of other team members. Um, as for how long it took, it's kind of hard to say because it started out during university as a sort of part-time fun project. Um, but the actual full-time development time for me was over two years, so uh, quite a bit of time. And as for how many people have played, uh, hard to say. I don't know, but uh, we have like uh, I don't know. We had like we did a Kickstarter in in era. Of, June of last year, that brought in eighteen thousand dollars. I think we had like around four hundred backers there, which should have received a copy. I don't know if they played it. Um, and then on Steam, I think the sales numbers have been uh, a couple hundred. Like I think uh, seven hundred, eight hundred purchases or so. Maybe a thousand by now. I'm not sure. But again, no idea how many actually played. So. Anything else? Anything from the chat on Twitch? 
No, we have, uh, we have a question. Oh. We have the challenge of this is uh, using in some kind of object-oriented modeling, and what about the performance? The yes, so question is how much of this is using some kind of object-oriented layer and what is the performance of this? So pretty much everything is using CLOS. Um, the event system is just one generic function called handle which takes an event object and the receiver object. It ha has like I think almost a thousand methods registered on it. Um, the collision system invokes generic functions all the interactions are generic functions. The render method, uh, render function is a generic function. It's all CLOS stuff. Uh, all the game objects are class instances with slots and whatever. Um, the performance is just fine. It's fine. Like you don't need to worry about it. I had, I spent very little time optimizing things. What I did was mostly avoiding garbage uh, generation so that we don't incur the GC too often. Um, and even that was just like not being very stupid. Uh, so like you could definitely optimize this a huge lot more to run on like way older systems because it's not that demanding. But like game developers especially have a, a tendency to like start out by writing things in like, oh, I'm going to write assembly now. And it's like, all right, guess you're ne never making a game. <laughs> graphics resolution has nothing to do with performance, it's an aesthetics choice. Yes, so that's mostly a, an aesthetics choice and a, a production choice because it's easier to do pixel art. Yeah. Yes? So, question to the audience if they do you want to play? So, I have one instance running of a Steam Deck with <laughs> Talk to me about that. And the question to you is now that you have all this infrastructure, I mean, you have done the hard part of getting games to Steam. So, so now deploying the next game would be quite a bit easier, right? So, so do you plan to can we expect another time? Uh, the question is, so uh, uh, next game should be easier to make, and also are you going to make a next game? I'm going to make a next game, yes, but it's not going to be easier to make because it'll be a 3D game, so... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have you had any experience developing in other platforms? And if so, or and if not, uh, how do you compare the development cycle of uh, what you did here with Common List best, uh, in comparison to uh, developing with Unity or uh, other engines that can repackage this all the developer business? Okay, so the question is, uh, uh, how does this compare to other more established engines like Unity or Unreal? Um, I don't know. Uh, I never, like, I've, I've had both Unity and Unreal installed on my computers for like a decade, and I could never get bothered enough to actually look up how they work. Same for Godot. Uh, sorry, Godot folks out there. Um, but it's just, this is what I like to do. And if I had to use Unity or Unreal or whatever, I would probably just not make games. So. I can't give you any advice on, on like how good this is. I usually when people ask me this, I say, don't do what I did because it's probably a terrible idea for like making financially successful games because the development effort involved is just going to be much higher because all of this stuff doesn't exist. And if you can just download the plugin for five bucks, you're done. Right. Uh, so, but this is fun for me. So there you go. Yes. So who, who's the main character and what's the point of the game? Uh, so the main character is called The Stranger. Uh, the point of the game is it's a post-apocalypse and you wake up in some kind of uh, pile of rubble and you don't know what happens but you're immediately pulled into by the person that found you into sort of a squabble that's going on where it turns out there's several different kinds of warring factions still living in this post-apocalyptic environment and they're not on good terms with each other, and you're sent around to investigate what's going on and see if you can somehow help out. Yes? Yeah, I have a question about the GC. So, like, how long are the GC pauses typically, and uh, what, what is interrupted by that, and what is not interrupted by the GC pause? Uh, okay, hold on. Okay, so the question is, what are the GC pauses and what is interrupted and what is not? So this is displaying the graphs. You can see the RAM going up 
steadily on the left there, you can see the frame drops. Occasionally, for instance, when the RAM drops, there is a frame drop there. Right. So you do get like occasional hitches. Usually it's not enough to be noticeable, um, at least to me and most people. Um, and that's pretty much the biggest effect of it. Uh, you can avoid having GC problems if you just don't cons anything. So you just like pre-allocate everything. And that's one of the techniques we use to get rid of most of the cons. And we just pre-allocate most things. And then you're fine because the GC is just not going to care. Um, we can do that more aggressively, but again, at this point, it's like fine enough where I don't need to care. Oh, so that's good. But it's like in general, kind of hard to avoid that in all cases. So there is going to be positions where you're going to want to just throw around some garbage. Yes. Is, is, is that going to be a problem with 3D models because they are inherently more, uh, heavy? Uh, no. No, so for 3D models especially, and for all the geometry data that you're actually seeing, that's not going to be streamed in or dynamically allocated. You're loading that during the load time, you're uploading it to the GPU once, and then it's there. And so the way OpenGL works is that you, you allocate a, a, a buffer and tell it how big it's going to be, you fill that up with data, and then OpenGL has to take care of like when it's going to actually upload it to the GPU or take it out of the GPU. You don't have any control over that. You do in Vulkan, so if you are going more low level with Vulkan stuff, you have to worry about that yourself. Uh, I don't, so I'm just going to not take responsibility. 